Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 675 for January 7th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. Bedford County wants the story of Nearest Green there. The way that they have opened their their doors, their hearts, and I get messages every day from people I've never met in, in that area saying, thank you for bringing this story here. Thank you for bringing this distillery here. Back in November, Fawn Weaver told us about her work researching and sharing the story of Nathan Nearest Green, the former slave who not only taught Jack Daniel how to distill whiskey, but became the first head distiller when Jack Daniel opened his own distillery after the end of the Civil War. At the time, Fawn only hinted at plans to open her own distillery in Tennessee to make the uncle nearest 1856 Tennessee whiskey, which is part of her mission to share the nearest green story. Those plans are in place now, and we'll catch up with Fawn Weaver to get the details on this week's Whiskey Cast in depth. I'll also have the calendar of events, this week's Your Voice, and the What I'm Tasting This Week department, all coming up on the first Whiskey Cast of 2018. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. The holidays are a time to celebrate, to share something special with friends and family. This year, why not consider sharing something truly special, an engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Support for Whiskey Cast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Let's get started with the week's news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. We'll begin with a story out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that narrowly avoided becoming a tragedy. Investigators are trying to figure out what caused an accident at Wiggle Distillery Thursday. While there was apparently no explosion, one of the stills at the distillery was knocked off its mountings, according to Pittsburgh Fire Chief Daryl Jones in an interview with KDKA Television. One worker was hurt in the accident, but is reported to be doing well, with what Wiggle co-owner Meredith Grelly described as surface injuries in a statement. In an email this weekend, she told us there has been a lot of misreporting on the story, but that she would not be available for an interview until Monday. It's the third reported accident at a U.S. craft distillery in the last two months. One of the founders of the Island Beach Rum Distillery in New Jersey is recovering from burns after a December 23rd accident. Three people were hospitalized in Houston following a fire at the B.J. Hooker's Vodka Distillery November 6th. The first distillery deal of 2018 was announced on Friday as Constellation Brands is buying a minority stake in the Copper and King's Brandy Distillery in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes, Copper and Kings makes brandy, but has also become a key player in Kentucky's craft distilling industry. It teamed up with the Bardstown Bourbon Company back in September to release the collaboration series of bourbons finished in Copper and Kings barrels. By the way, Constellation Brands also has a stake in the Bardstown Bourbon Company. Terms of the Copper and Kings deal were not announced. And while I'm talking about Louisville, If you're flying in and out of Louisville on a bourbon country visit, there's a new option for buying bottles of bourbon to take home on your flight. Louisville International Airport has now joined Lexington's airport in offering bourbon sales after you clear the security checkpoints. The airport's distillery district marketplace has been licensed by the state for packaged liquor sales and is now open for bottle sales seven days a week, starting as early as 6 a.m. Monday through Saturday. Karen Scott is the airport authority's interim executive director. It's really embracing um, holistically, I think, a culture that we have here in Louisville, and certainly the theme of bourbonism 
And actually, one of our sayings that we have, one of the themes that we have in our terminal is Louisville, distilling great experiences. And so it it really just um, is is kind of iconic with that. This is the latest bourbon-related project at Louisville International. Last year, the Book and Bourbon Southern Kitchen Restaurant and Bar opened up just outside of the security checkpoint. There's also been a Kentucky Bourbon Trail gift shop for years now at the airport. And Scott told me the airport has been used to people flying with bourbon. Because of the Kentucky Derby, we have a traditional campaign that we do um, where we talk about liquor is liquid. And um, during the Derby, we actually would have bubble wrap stations for our customers that when they would buy something in the community and then they're getting ready to head out, we would package it up for them. But unfortunately, it still had to go into their checked bags. And you know, so we're wrapping it up in bubble wrap, trying to protect it the best we can and going into their check bags, you know, obviously with the hopes that everything makes it on, on the backside. Ideally, our patrons, you know, would have enjoyed being able to carry it with them. And so certainly we've seen that over the years, and this has been a way to to do that for them. So post-checkpoint um, in our distillery district marketplace facility, um, having this available to them. Now they can go through the checkpoint. They've got their their carry-on bags with them. Now they can purchase their bourbon and they can carry it on with them and and take the care um, that's needed for the bottle on on the trip home. Now, what provisions are being made for safety-related issues? Uh, Is this going to be treated similar to a duty-free shop, for instance, where the uh, whiskey bottles go into a uh, sealable bag that stays sealed until uh, somebody gets to their destination. Um, If somebody has to connect and go through security at another airport, they're going to have to uh, have some issues with that, aren't they? First off, the the patron purchases um, the item in the, in the, uh, the gift store. Um, They carry it on the airplane with them. The FAA regulations prohibit the customer from partaking of any of that um, on the airplane they're not segregated in any way like you might see in a duty-free shop. Um, in duty-free, uh, you know, there's some special caps that can go on um, the actual bottles themselves. Um, there are limits of, of how much you can bring on as far as a quantity. Um, five liters per passenger is the limit that you um, can bring on. And then that, that's a regulation through DOT. Um, and then, but on the other end, then that is something that a customer would need to be aware of is if they are getting to an airport and are going to be subject to going back through screening, then unfortunately this is going to exceed the limits that TSA will allow them to bring through. So for us, the intent is that folks are leaving Louisville, they're leaving this as, you know, the destination that they came to, and now they're returning back to their kind of their origin. So, they're going home, um, they may be transferring through an airport, but they're totally staying on airside as a result, so they're not having to go back through security again. Right now, the shop only stocks nine different bourbon brands, including Angel's Envy, Bullet, Evan Williams, Four Roses, Jim Beam, Knob Creek, Maker's Mark, Old Crow, and Wild Turkey. Parody's Lagardere, which operates the airport's concessions, is working with local distributors to expand that range over the coming year. And, by the way, this is not a duty-free shop. Prices include all of the regular state and federal taxes. One more note out of bourbon country. The Kentucky Distillers Association has had its annual changeover in officers. Rob Samuels of Maker's Mark is the KDA's 2018 chairman, He becomes the fourth-generation member of the Samuels family to hold that position. Of course, his father, Bill Samuels Jr., and grandfather, Bill Sr., also chaired the KDA. His great-grandfather, Leslie Samuels, was the KDA's chairman back in the pre-prohibition days as well. Rick Robinson of Wild Turkey was named vice chairman, and Larry Cass of Heaven Hill will be the secretary-treasurer this year. Last time around, I mentioned Queen Elizabeth's New Year's Honors list and the honors for Lakes Distillery co-founder Nigel Mills and Beefeater Gin Master Distiller Desmond Payne. Well, that list is about 25 pages long, and I missed one, 
Wine and Spirits Education Trust Chief Executive Ian Harris was also on the list. He was named a member of the Order of the British Empire, or MBE. The trust is the largest organization providing certifications for wine and spirits professionals around the world. And congratulations. We do have a few new whiskeys to mention on this first whiskey cast of 2018. Glen Morangie is adding another single malt to its Legends collection for the travel retail market. The Cad Ball is matured in ex-bourbon casks and finished in Muscat and Simillon wine barriques. It does not carry an age statement and will sell for about 75 pounds. That's $102 a bottle at current exchange rates. It joins Duthac and Tain as the permanent expressions in the Legends collection, along with the limited edition Tarlogan. Douglas Lang and Company is one for one so far with weekly new product announcements in 2018. I kid, of course, but Fred Lang and his team are celebrating the company's 70th anniversary this year, and the first release of 2018 is the Timorous Beastie 10-year-old, just in time for Burns Night later this month. Of course, the poet Robert Burns referred to the Timorous Beastie in his poem To a Mouse. It's the Highland Blended Malt in Douglas Lang's Remarkable Regional Malts range and will be available globally with a recommended retail price of around 35 pounds. That's about 47.50 U.S. Glen Murray's Elgin Classic Sherry Cask Finish has been around for the last year and a half in Europe, but it's now coming to the U.S. market for the first time. It's matured in ex-bourbon barrels for up to seven years, depending on taste, with up to a year of finishing time in Oloroso sherry casks. It'll be available nationwide in the U.S. for about $30 a bottle. Tennessee's Sugarlands Distilling Company in Gatlinburg will be releasing its fourth batch of Roaming Man Tennessee Straight Rye Whiskey soon. It's set to go on sale February 2nd. The last batch went on sale in October and sold out in just a few hours. And finally, with all of the talk about newfangled ways to speed up whiskey maturation, it is well worth noting that we've been down this road before. Great Britain's National Archives has released some declassified letters between Board of Trade officials from back in 1952 outlining what was said to be a new process for accelerated whiskey maturation developed at Federcairn Distillery. That process was claimed to reduce maturation time from years to just a few hours, with early tests showing that the spirit retained the character of a conventionally matured pot still distilled single malt, but with a much higher alcohol content. The trade officials were worried that if word of that process got out, Foreign distillers could use it to wipe out Scotch whiskey's export markets. However, when Glasgow whiskey blender Alexander McGavin tried to replicate the process on a larger scale, it failed miserably with significant evaporation and a loss of proof. Apparently, the angels were the only ones who liked the stuff. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com, and this week you'll find my top 10 whiskey predictions for 2018, too. The news is brought to you by Highland Park. Tired of the cold, dark winter days? I know I am. Warm up with a dram of Highland Park's latest release, The Dark. It's a 17-year-old single malt matured in first-filled European oak sherry casks, and it celebrates the winter and the contrasting seasons on Orkney. Of course, you can look for the light later this year as the seasons change, too. Until then, you'll find the dark at a whiskey shop near you. And you can get the details at highlandparkwhiskey.com. You don't need a special occasion to open a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label. But when you have a special occasion... Why not celebrate with a specially engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label? Here's how one whiskey lover celebrated his team's recent success. He arranged to have 108 specially engraved bottles of Johnny Walker Blue Label made for his co-workers. You might say he hit a home run. Just like a perfectly executed double play. Johnny Walker Blue Label is smooth and well-rounded. 
and unlike a trophy, never needs polishing. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker. Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Johnny Walker Blue Label Blended Scotch Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo, North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. It's almost time for my annual trip to British Columbia for the Victoria Whiskey Festival. Don't forget to join us two weeks from now for special coverage from Victoria on WhiskeyCast. Let's open up the inbox now for this week's Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. I mentioned my top 10 whiskey predictions for 2018 a couple of minutes ago. You can read the entire list at whiskeycast.com, but I thought I'd share some of the responses to it so far. One of my predictions, and I know this is a real stretch, is that whiskey prices are going to continue to rise in 2018. I know, no kidding. But longtime listener Jeffrey Steuben posted this on our Facebook page. Good predictions. My biggest concern has been price. It turns off some that were scotch drinkers to find a cheaper dram. Yes, the search to find something new is going to shift palates, but my biggest concern is how hard it will be to attract new drinkers. I was able to try many different whiskeys and finding some that I prefer, but now the entry-level drinker may not even try any since they would be out of the price range they could afford. Thanks, Jeffrey. That's one of the things that worries me, too. I also predicted that we might see some whiskey makers that released no-age statement whiskeys in the last few years to replace some of their flagship age statement versions start to reverse that trend. David Sturk of the Creative Whiskey Company in Scotland had this response, and I'm quoting now, I see scotch sales falling in the U.S., I don't see any Scottish micro-distillery partnerships or conglomerations, as per your point number 10. I believe prices of younger Scotch single malts will fall and more younger 8- to 12-year-old age statements will be released. There will also be several new independent bottlers both in the U.S. and of Scotch and U.S. distillate and outside the U.S. I also don't see any slowdown in the creation of new distilleries in Scotland. All in my opinion. Thanks, David. And former White and Mackay PR man Rob Bruce challenged my take on age statements with this comment. I think the industry realized what a huge rod it had made for its own back with the long and constant campaign to associate age with quality. Consumers now realize it was and is a red herring, and it would be very silly for whiskey firms to reinforce that myth again. Jamie Milne, previously of The Whiskey Shop and William Grant & Sons, chimed in with this comment. The messaging around age statements was surely a result of the glut of aged whiskey that the industry was sitting on in the late 90s following the overproduction of the 80s. We're now in the opposite situation with many brands struggling to meet demand and producing an increasing number of story-led expressions with no age statement in an effort to meet demand in the short term, while they grow production capacity to enable higher volumes of age statement expressions in the medium term. Thanks, Jamie, and I appreciate all of the comments so far. Please keep them coming. Each year, I ask you to share your last dram of the old year and your first dram of the new year with us on social media. This year, the hashtags were 2017 last dram, and 2018 First Dram. We had a lot of great responses. Mike York of Seattle's last dram of 2017 was a Kilhoman 100% Isla single malt, and his first dram of 2018, Lafroig 18, quite appropriate. Christopher Winters of Zionsville, Indiana, went along with that theme. He ended 2017 with a 17-year-old Balveni Sherry Oak, and started 2018 with a Glenmorangie 18-year-old. Angie Ball in Scotland picked Glen Murray's 1994 Sherry Cask as her final 2017 whiskey, and a Scotch Malt Whiskey Society Beaumore bottling as her first of 2018. Whiskey Canuck, and of course Montreal, had a Glenfarclas 1985 Family Cask to wind up 2017, 
and a three ships, 15 year old Pinotage finish from South Africa for the first dram of 2018. For the record, my final dram of 2017 was the Brook Laddie 1992 single cask from Speciality Drinks that I mentioned on last week's show. And my first dram of 2018 was the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof Bourbon, batch number C917. And you can find my tasting notes for both of them right now at whiskeycast.com. If you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. If you'd like to hear your comment on the show, just record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And, of course, you'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, too. This week's Your Voice is brought to you by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. There's a free Aberlauer tasting this Wednesday night, January 10th at Norman's Kill in Brooklyn, New York. The Harrow Whiskey Festival is on the 12th and 13th in London. Westland Distillery in Seattle is hosting a yoga class and whiskey tasting for those with some flexibility on Saturday, January 13th. The SoCal Whiskey Wonderland is on the 14th in Long Beach, California. The Edmonton MS Whiskey Festival is on the 17th, followed by the Calgary MS Whiskey Festival the very next night in Alberta. They're both leading up to the Victoria Whiskey Festival the 18th through the 21st in Victoria, British Columbia. McTeers has its first whiskey auction of the year, January 19th in Glasgow, Scotland. And if the cold weather is getting to you, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's U.S. chapter will be holding a Burns on the Beach celebration January 31st in Miami, Florida. Right now, there are 191 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. We're always adding new events each week. If you have a whiskey tasting or a festival coming up, just use the contact form on our website and let us know all about it. Seven swans are swimming, six geese are laying, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All seems a little excessive, doesn't it? When there's one bird they really want this Christmas, red breast. The warm glow of ripe fruit, honeyed figs, and crackling cinnamon. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, and the perfect gift to slip under the tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Back in November, Fawn Weaver joined us for episode 666. She's been trying to spread the story of Nathan Nearest Green, the former slave who taught Jack Daniel how to distill whiskey as a young man in Tennessee. And when Green became a free man following the end of the Civil War, Jack Daniel hired him to be the head distiller at his new distillery. Ever since then, at least one of Mr. Green's descendants has always been working at Jack Daniel's. Weaver created the Uncle Nearest 1856 whiskey brand as part of her mission to spread that story, with part of the sales going to the Nearest Green Foundation, which funds college scholarships for Mr. Green's descendants. When I talked with Fawn in that original interview, she dropped some hints about the brand's short-term future. We're grateful. As of yesterday, we signed the purchase agreement and and we'll announce that uh, within the next couple of months, the location where it is right now, we're we're going through the process. We have contractors out and just kind of outfitting it for what we need and the production that we expect, but also so that there can be a great experience because we're talking about the first African-American master distiller to be acknowledged. And so we want for people to be able to come in and have a true distillery tourism type of experience. And, um, and so we, we hope to be able to provide that. Well, now we know the rest of the story. She and her team have acquired a 270 acre horse farm in Shelbyville, Tennessee, 
It's about 15 miles north of Lynchburg. And just before Christmas, local officials approved the rezoning of that site to become the home of the nearest green distillery. I caught up with Fawn Weaver this week to get an update on the story. Tell me about the plans now that you've got them firmed up. Where's the distillery going to be and what's the timeline? Absolutely. You may or may not be familiar with the Sand Creek Farms. So for Tennessee, we're really known truly for what? Three things. It's whiskey, great country music, and walking horses. And so I would pass by this walking horse farm, this beautiful 270-acre walking horse farm that you have to pass by in order to get to Lynchburg. And I would pass it every day coming in and out of of Nashville, going up to meetings. And and I just kept looking at that going, that is the place. If they ever put that on the market, that is the place. And the day they put it on the market, I think we made the phone call. And we weren't sure whether or not we were going to be able to do it. It obviously wasn't zoned as a distillery. And as you see with some of the challenges Sazerac's having, just trying to put a distillery right up the road from where we'll be, we, we just did not want to close on a property without knowing the outcome. And so we did our best to keep it under wraps <laughs> for the last month and a half that we've been going through all the commission meetings and all the rest of that great stuff. And I have to tell you that Bedford County wants the story of Nearest Green there, the way that they have opened their, their doors, their hearts. And I get messages every day from people I've never met in in that area saying, thank you for bringing this story here. Thank you for bringing this distillery here. So we went through four commission meetings, believe it or not, zero opposition from the public and unanimous from every single council. Well, you talk about Bedford County, but this actually was part of the old original Lincoln County, right? It was not. It was not. So we purchased a property in Bedford County, and this is it is in the heart of Shelbyville. So there is a part of Bedford County that was Lincoln County. We are right on the outside of that. Okay. I just want to make sure I got that right. So you've got people that want you there. When do you start actually building it? Uh, now. <laughs> So we, we had already brought in uh, Lee Adcock Construction with the hopes that it would get approved. And so we knew if it didn't get approved, we were going to lose some money on it. But with the hope that it got approved, we had them already begin building it out. And a part of that is is that we want to be able to control our quality. There are certain aspects of our business, even though we are sourcing from a couple of different distilleries, We still want to be able to do that final process in-house. We want to be able to bottle in-house. Our bottling company has now told us on two occasions, at your current pace, you are going to outgrow us very quickly, so have a plan B in place. (laughs) So the first time they told us that, I looked at the plan B being another bottling house. The second time he told us that, I realized we better get our own. And so the first building that will be built is the bottling house and the first Rick house because of all of the barrels that we have sourced and that we bring together for the Uncle Nearest product. We want to make sure that we continue to age them in-house and that we're able to bottle in-house and and have that final package going out there. And the distillery comes later, right? The distillery comes later. So we are essentially... There are so many people who want to be able to experience the story of Nearest Green. This has obviously touched a chord with a lot of people. You mentioned even on your show, it touched quite a a chord with people. And they love hearing this story and wanting to be able to honor the first African-American master distiller. So one of the first buildings we are converting, the, the property itself has 18 buildings on it. Several of them we are going to be able to convert. And one of the first ones we are converting is an old 300-foot horse barn that we are completely gutting and turning into the nearest green history walk. So as you go in on the left-hand side of it, all the way down this very long hallway, you will see the story of not just nearest green, but African Americans who helped to really truly found the whiskey, American whiskey industry, if you want to say it that way, but they were so critical in the beginning So being able to share their stories from 
Maryland to Pennsylvania to Kentucky, and to include that as well as obviously nearest and nearest as children. And on the right-hand side, we are going to have just barrels stacked. Those will not be filled with whiskey, but they will be there. And every time we have someone of great notoriety or a descendant of nearest come to the distillery, we will have them sign it and we'll seal it. And that will just kind of become our wall of legends that walk through that place. So that is one of the first things that we will build so that those who are really craving to see more of this story, they're able to walk through that and experience that pretty early on. Now, you could have built this on the farm where you've got your place now because you've got the old original Dan Call farm. We do. But you chose not to. We did. We did. We, we chose not to for uh, several reasons, but one of them was, two, two of them, one, our enormous respect for our neighbors and bringing trucks in and out and in and out, although that's where the original Jack Daniel distillery was until 1881. Things were just different then. They were bringing, I mean, Jack was bringing in mules. <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't bringing in tankers. And so the respect for our neighbors, but also just the enormous amount of respect we have for Jack Daniel, he, the way that he treated nearest and nearest children, we had to look and just internally in the company say, if nearest were here, knowing that Jack has established so much in Lynchburg, would he actually want to encroach upon that? And we all concluded absolutely not that Jack would be raising a glass to nearest and nearest would be raising a glass to Jack. And, and so we wanted to make sure that as our company continued to grow and their company continues to grow, that we're able to be supportive of one another and never find ourselves going after the same parcel <laughs> to try to grow. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun with this still. Just when I hear you laugh, it sounds like you're just really <laughs> excited about this. I am. If you, I, I just got off the phone with, with uh, someone from Soledad O'Brien's team, and, they, and we were talking about this, and she said, oh, my word, I had no idea that this story was this exciting. And so I think we've really, just the tip of the iceberg is what people have experienced so far, because the story has so many facets, so many wonderful things about it. But no, I am definitely not tired of, of telling this story. Ask me again in 10 years, maybe, but... No, I, I am having a blast uncovering this and, and sharing it with the world. The site will also include at least 100 acres of farmland growing corn for the distillery's use, and the farm's existing 600-seat horse arena will be turned into a concert venue. That's this week's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, with more than 200 years of whiskey making experience on Isla. Look for the Lagavulin 16 year old the Lagavulin Distillers Edition, and the new Lagavulin 8-year-old single malts at a whiskey shop near you. And find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. During the news, I mentioned the collaboration whiskeys from the Bardstown Bourbon Company and Louisville's Copper and Kings Distillery, I've had samples of both 10-year-old bourbons sitting on my tasting table for a while now. And the story this week of Constellation Brands taking a minority stake in Copper and Kings reminded me to open those samples up. Let's start with the Collaboration Brandy finish. Since Margetown bourbon is only a little more than a year old, the 10-year-old bourbon for both whiskeys came from MGP in Indiana but the casks were picked by one of Bourbon's best distillers, Bardstown Bourbon Master Distiller and Bourbon Hall of Fame member Steve Nally. This one was finished in casks used for Copper and King's brandy and kept in the Copper and King's warehouse for 18 months. It's bottled at 56.5% ABV. The nose has notes of red grapes, charred oak, brown sugar, pipe tobacco, and caramel. The taste is tart, fruity and peppery with cinnamon and clove spices, plums, blackberries, red grapes, brown sugar, and a nice oakiness. The finish is subtle and dry. I'm scoring the Collaboration Brandy finish an 89. 
The second collaboration took that same bourbon and finished it for 18 months in Copper and King's Muscat Mistel barrels. The Mistel is unfermented grape juice that was fortified with unaged brandy straight off the still, then left to age in a barrel for 18 months. The result is one of the most unique whiskeys I've ever tasted, and let me tell you right now, this one will not be to everyone's taste, especially you bourbon traditionalists. The nose is mellow with hints of butterscotch, green grapes, subtle spices, vanilla, and just a hint of linseed oil. The taste is very complex and unusual. It's peppery with a white wine-like tartness and touches of linseed oil, cardamom, anise, and baking chocolate, and the finish is long with touches of dark chocolate, linseed oil, butterscotch, and just a hint of bitter lemon. Once again, this bourbon is not going to be for everyone, but if you try it and you like it, you're really, really going to like it. I'm scoring the collaboration 10-year-old bourbon Muscat Mistel finish a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, makers of Whiskey Advocates 2017 Whiskey of the Year, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The 12-year-old barrel-proof bourbon was pitted blind against competition from around the globe and was consistently ranked number one by the magazine's testers. Meet the whole Elijah Craig family at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Let's move on now to the Singleton of Dufton Tailfire Edition. This one is a space-side single malt from Diageo's Singleton Range, and it's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has soft spices, dried fruits, butterscotch, caramel candy, and a soft oakiness. The taste starts off light and clean, with a good balance of spices and dried fruits that develops slowly. Give this one some time before you swallow it. The finish is smooth and lingering with a nice balance, and I'm scoring the Singleton of Dufton Tailfire an 89. And finally, distillery bottlings from Ben Nevis don't come along very often. As a matter of fact, the 15-year-old sherry cask is only the second Ben Nevis distillery bottling that I've done tasting notes on. This 2014 bottling was done at cask strength, 58% ABV, and the nose has notes of plums, raisins, berry cobbler, red grapes, and just a hint of fig cookies. The taste is thick and fruity with berry cobbler, a touch of cinnamon, plums, raisins, and red grapes. The finish is long, fruity, and mouth-watering. I'm scoring the Ben Nevis 15-year-old sherry cask a 92. It's worth noting that longtime Ben Nevis distillery manager Colin Ross is celebrating his 35th anniversary at the distillery in 2018, you can listen to my 2013 interview with him in episode number 435 of Whiskey Cast. You'll find it in the archives at whiskeycast.com. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'm adding them to the searchable list of more than 2,000 whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for Whiskey Cast HD videos and our Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel monthly podcast along with the latest news, events, and a whole lot more. I hope you'll help us out this week and share Whiskey Cast with your whiskey-loving friends. You can also help other people learn about the show by leaving ratings or reviews for us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Those ratings get figured into the search results that help other whiskey lovers discover the show when they're looking for new podcasts. Of course, you can also connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. My email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. You don't need a special occasion to celebrate with something truly unique, but a personally engraved bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label can make any occasion special. Support for WhiskeyCast comes from Johnny Walker, Visit johnnywalker.com to find out more about engraving options near you. Whiskey cast. 
brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.